Uh, I'm Judy Samuelson with the Aspen Institute. I run the Business and Society program, which is a what the Aspen Institute calls a policy program. And our work is deeply focused on the role of business and society. And we are obsessed with three basic ideas. One is the power of business to affect change. It is our belief that business is the institution of our age. And with it comes remarkable talent, resources, and capacities, global reach and distribution systems, problem solving skills with extraordinary capacity. But we're locked down onto some ideas that thwart business from staying long term and from having alignment with the long term health of society. And that's boldly the idea under which we work. The second idea is to affect real change in business. We need to work where business really lives which means we have to affect the decision rules of business and the incentive systems that drive change in business. How many of you are from the business sector? You know of which I speak. Business is just like other people who exist at this conference and who are choosing other paths to affect change in the world. But business, like most systems, is deeply influenced by the decision rules and incentive systems that drive behavior. And so that's where we work. And then finally, we really believe in the power of leaders to affect change, and that's why we're here today. So we work with leaders in the academic system. We work with business in the boardroom and executive suites. But we also work with what we call social entrepreneurs and have been for a number of years. So in the, around 2000, we started convening heads of HR in public companies to say, how do you influence the behavior and the thinking and the attitudes and the knowledge of people inside business to be able to be effective at managing this complex kind of dual reality of driving business results and also <coughs> working within a, a larger system that has expectations and needs from business. And that went on for a long time. In 2006, we said, let's quit talking and start to do something. And we went into kind of a rapid prototyping of a fellowship program, of which I am delighted to have three stunning examples up here. It's called the First Movers Fellowship Program. This is the current class of the First Movers Fellowship Program. We're just recruiting our fifth class. There are 21 in each class. They are largely drawn from big, hairy, bad, big business, powerful, globe-trotting, resource-sucking uh, corporations, of which you're going to hear from three of them up here, uh, two, two public companies, one private company. Um, the First Movers program was launched then in 2008. We're recruiting our fifth class now. One of our fellows is in the current class, and two of them are from the last year's, last year's class. So um, I tell them I can't remember who knows who anymore. We're kind of getting my, but this is the most fun thing we get to do. So we get to work with these people who are working with inside business to drive change. We want to hear a little bit about their stories talk a little bit about the challenges they face and what sustains their work, and then open it up for a conversation. So we hope to be in a kind of a, a broader conversation with you all in about half an hour, OK? So um, what we I'd like to do is just spend one more minute on the fellowship program just to give you a flavor for this work of driving social up for a conversation. So there are basically four pillars of this program. It's a year-long fellowship program. People come in and they meet three times over the course of nine months in kind of intensive four-day sessions. Uh, 21 companies represented in the room. And the four pillars are basically innovation, where we work on, we teach and, and experiment with ideas around piloting and prototyping and problem reframing. There's a, a leadership component of this, which is teaching the value of storytelling in firms. We have a curriculum called Giving Voice to Values. Um, the third piece is really driving a community. It's about exiting this program with a, a very tight Rolodex of fellow travelers, the kind of people on which you can have very frank conversations about the challenges as well as the successes. And then finally, we teach the habits of reflection. We use a lot of poetry. We try to build into all of our lives, and I come sustained after every one of these meetings, about the importance of stepping out of the fray and thinking again about who you are, why you're on the planet, and what it is you're trying to accomplish. And so those are kind of the four pieces of the program. And now let's go to the fellows. So we'll start with, we have, we have I had to write this down to make sure I got this right. On our, representing our panel today, we have a South African working in Ghana, a Turk working in New York, 
and a Swiss working in the Philippines. So that's our kind of our, um, our attempt to have this be a global conversation. And we'll start with James. So James, I'm going to sit down. You can stay sitting. Um, but tell us a little bit about your, your project. My name is James Inglesby, and I currently work for Unilever. And uh, my project uh, is obviously not the greatest topic to talk about over lunch, but it was a toilet project. So uh, uh, at one point after working for Unilever for a few years, I wanted to do something different. And I was looking to join a team that were looking at new business models, new ways of doing things. And I just recently finished uh, working in our household care category, which is the glamorous world of toilet cleaners and surface cleaners. And I was like, no, now I want to do something very different and innovative. And I came across a group in the business called the New Business Unit. And they were looking at doing new innovative things that Unilever could be working in in 5, 10, 15 years' time. And I joined the team, very excited. And they go, James, we've got a great project we want you to work on. It's a toilet project. And at first, I thought, well, this is quite interesting. And, but why toilets? And then I started investigating a lot more into the current situation. So there's something like 2 billion people who don't have adequate access to sanitation. And the other thing that I found quite interesting was there's not a lot of innovation that had been going on in this area. So uh, our idea that we had was that we wanted to do an in-home domestic portable toilet. So that was the brief we were given saying, go ahead and see how you can create a business like this. And the reason why you'd think, why would Unilever be interested in this kind of business? And the reason being is that obviously we sell toilet cleaners, we sell soap to wash your hands after going to the toilet. So if you can help solve one of the big issues of sanitation, you would also do a great social good, but also grow our business at the same time. <clears throat> Um, so we were tasked then to go out and do this, and what we did is we went out and we said from day one, we want to use a different system. So the existing models that we'd seen in sanitation were very much like take something from the West, dump it into Africa, and it should work. Whereas what we wanted to do was we wanted to actually go into the areas and find out exactly what the problem was, what exactly these people wanted, and design it up. So very similar way how Unilever would design a new product. So could we use the... Uh, principles of a big multinational in creating uh, a toilet business that could also then help uh, with the, the social good. So uh, with the help of IDEO, uh, we went out and we came up with our concept, which was the, the clean team. And what we did and what we said from day one is we wanted to make sanitation sexy. There's a word that goes around. So we wanted to use branding and marketing uh, to get people to use these toilets and to grow this, um, this business. Uh, one of the key things we also had to do is that the technology never existed. So we use our skills and our abilities to actually design the toilet. So that's not actually one of them. Uh, that was one of the um, uh, prototype uh, models that we could buy off the market. But we actually went out and designed our own purpose-built toilet. And uh, over, you know, the thing that I'm quite proud about is we went from idea to pilot in a year. And then we went from pilot to a full scale in another year. So we managed to do the pilot at 100 scale, figure out what the problems were, but at the same time design the toilet and uh, then, then grow the business. And the great thing about it is that we've created a business where um, we're providing sanitation to people, but also a great channel for Unilever to sell its products. So now that you have a toilet in your home, we go around to the uh, customers and tell them, look, you need to wash your hands after using the toilet. Here's some products that you can use and um, you know, help take uh, the funds from the, the sale of the products go back into the social enterprise. And uh, what's quite interesting is this business we created is a joint partnership between an NGO, between Unilever, and then obviously the local team in Ghana. So that's a brief overview. What's the, what's the potential market? It's very big. Uh, I think in uh, Ghana, I think it's 80% 80, 80 of the population don't have adequate access to sanitation. How many people is that? Uh, it's 24, it's about uh, 18 million people. And, uh, but what we've done is quite interesting also is that when we've gone into our project is we never went for the poorest of the poor to start with. We went for the medium um, to poor area. So the poorest people, the, the, the wealthiest people without toilets, right? And the reason we did that is that we wanted to actually grow and learn before we go down. So eventually over time and innovation, we'll be able to get into a lower and lower cost model. So over time, we'll be able to um, hit more and more people. Why Ghana and where in Ghana? So the reason we chose Ghana is we had two criteria. We had one where our NGO partner was active and one where Unilever uh, had a very big presence. Um, and we've, we're working now in Kumasi, 
And uh, the reason we chose Kumasi over Accra is because currently Accra doesn't have a waste treatment plant, so we can't dispose of the waste from the toilets um, ethically. So whereas Kumasi has a waste treatment plant and, and things like that. But it was very important for us to have um, a, a location where Unilever had a strong presence and our NGO partner, because it's a much easier way of operating. Okay. Um, Regula, tell us your story. My name is Regula Shek. I am from Switzerland, as you said, and I work for Hilti. Hilti is a co corporation based in the Principality of Liechtenstein, and we are uh, producing tools and consumable and engineering services to the construction industry. We are represented in about 120 countries, and we have uh, about 20 to 22,000 people around the world working for Hilti. Um, we are privately owned. Um, until today and have been around for several, uh, for, for several, many years. So my project, it's not just my project, it's actually my project together with my colleague Corinna up there. She's the engineer and I'm the business, I'm covering the business side. Um, when we look at the, uh, the current population of uh, 7 billion and the, the expected growth uh, to, until uh, in 2030, where we expect to be at 8.4 billion, um, we know that there's going to be an enormous additional urbanization and a lot of people moving from, from rural areas to urban areas, in particular in Asia. And with that, we have an enormous problem of adequate housing, housing which is affordable for the base of the pyramid. For those who move from, urban areas, from rural areas to urban areas to hope to find a better life. Um, just to keep the demand or the, the need where it is today, considering the growth of the population until 2000 and, uh, 20, 2030, we would need to build about 100,000 units a day. And when you look at the construction industry and the financial uh, means which are out there, you just can figure out that this is just almost impossible to cope with. And Hilt is in the construction industry, and we said, let's look at this problem and see whether we can find a solution um, which, which kind of contributes to solving this problem. And we said, conventional technology, as, as good as it is, most probably is not going to solve the problem. And let's look at alternative technologies. And the project is really about development of alternative building material and prefab housing systems and housing material uh, which uh, creates housing for the base of the pyramid. Quality housing at affordable prices. And why is it alternative material? Because it is sustainable. Like looking into wood, for example. I mean, until when you cut a tree and until it grows back, it takes many, many years. And we said, if we take indigenous local material in the markets we're going into, like bamboo or coconut husk, we have a competitive advantage. We can use sustainable material. Maybe just to give an idea, bamboo as a building material grows in three years to the strengths it's needed to use it for the construction industry, while we know that wood, for example, takes much more time. So it is indeed a very uh, sustainable material available in many countries around the world, particularly in emerging markets where the housing need, need is significant. So we said, let's look into that. Um, my colleague in particular with a couple of universities in, in the Philippines and in Switzerland, we did a lot of research. And then uh, I came in with the, uh, through the Aspen Fellowship to look at the business concept and see what has to be changed and what kind of business model we need to develop to really bring such a technology to scale. Can you say a bit more about the business model here? What, what I hear from James is that the business model is essentially uh, Unilever products uh, around a service and a product, which may, whether the toilet itself is the money maker here, what I hear is that it's the products. Can you say anything about the business model for Hilti and the affordable housing side? Um, or what the barrier is, perhaps? I cannot say so much yet about the business model because the fact is after the Aspen program was finished, you know, we decided that we take the concept to realization. And with that, I moved actually my job from the corporate side, being a VP in finance, to now really focusing on on the ground in the Philippines what is actually needed to make it work. 
So we've only been on the ground for like nine months. Um, and we expect to have a, a clear idea of what business model really could work in the Philippines in about five months. Um, I think it's actually important when you start with such an idea not to immediately venture into go down one particular road mm -hmm. because I think we have to be very creative and, and actually when we talk about you know disrupting a market to look at all the kind of options. So I couldn't tell you yet whether what kind of business model I'm going to apply but that's actually the beauty, which also my co company has given us, the leeway, the opportunity just to go and take these 12 months mm -hmm. and, and look at the problem from all different angles, triangulate, and then come back with this option. Thanks. I hope we can come back to this question of what gives you the degrees of freedom to operate within the corporation. But Asahan, let's move to you and hear a bit about your story. I'm Asan Danskurdu. I work at Citigroup. Um, Never in, heard of it. <laughs> um, we, I work in corporate strategy on an everyday basis. I look at our business model, particularly on the institutional side, um, where we operate, how we serve our institutional clients. My Aspen project um, has to do with energy um, efficiency or alternative energy solutions in emerging markets, which is not what I do every day. So it's, it's hard to say it's my project. I'm collaborating with um, our bankers, um, our sustainability team, and our government affairs um, to find uh, solutions, one market, innovative solutions um, at, a, at scale. And one market we're looking at is Turkey, where, as you know, energy deficiency is, is um, a big problem. They have to import 80% of their energy. And what we're trying to do is um, a relatively large-scale project where we can come in with investors, partner with the government or, or one of the larger institutions in the country, um, whether it's one alternative is solar, which is, as you know, many of you know well. Another alternative is energy efficiency, retrofitting buildings to, and then pass on the savings to investors, which obviously is a very complex um, structure in a country like Turkey. Um, so it's, the, the, it's still in thought stages, unlike um, my fellows here who actually have closer relationship with the, with the physical product at hand. Can you say a little bit about the vision of it? I mean, if, if in a world of, uh, there is no world of no constraints within, your, within Citigroup, but let's envision a little bit what, what the potential is here. Do you have a sense of any, any kind of scale that you could say, either in terms of what you think the base of investment may end up looking like, or? Um, I, I mean, I think we would look at a few hundred million dollar project to start with, but if you take energy efficiency alone, um, the, nobody knows really all the details, but they say it's a trillion dollar opportunity once somebody is able to crack the code. Okay. Great. So we have, um, one of the things I just back up and say about the fellowship program is that the design of the program is that everyone who applies for the program comes in with a specific kind of project, a process innovation, an, a, an initiative, a new business concept, something, it has to be market facing. It has to be somehow have the um, potential to be a, a business over time, either cost reducing for the company or revenue and growth enhancing or attracting new car, uh, customers or a change in the brand. So the, it, it's very much the idea is embedded in the, the the purpose of the project in some ways is to be the container for the learning. So that although I would say in our, the course of the last uh, four years, rarely do the projects stay exactly on track. And that, of course the point of the fellowship is to enable people to step back and say, how do I do this better? So let me just use that as a pivot here and talk maybe a little bit about the transition you've all gone through. Aslahan is still in her the current year of the fellowship program. These guys are a year out, but have obviously been at these, these questions for a longer period of time in their companies. But let me start with you, James. What do you think it is that um, allows you or has allowed you the degrees of freedom to try to get this off the ground? I mean, what's, what's the, what are the barriers to you being able to do this work inside Unilever, and what, what's think, enabled you I to think move? I what, think what was very fortunate about our project and how we managed to get it off the ground was the freedom we had. 
And the, the reason we had the freedom was the group that we were sitting in. So we had a very small group who reported directly to the CTO, and we were given the brief to go out and do things innovatively and differently, right? And we're told to go out, understand, and come back and report to them. But I think the barriers actually came from the core business. So when, you know, simple things like just trying to convince the local business in Ghana that this is a good idea. So it took us at least four or five visits to the MD in Ghana before he started going, okay, I'll, I'll talk to you guys. And at first he thought, who are these crazy guys coming from Europe trying to change and fix one of the biggest problems in their country? But over time, he realized that we were serious and he, he really bought into it. And you know, now they're actually one of some of our biggest supporters. They've even helped us with things like importing the toilets. So one of our biggest challenges was like, how do we get these toilets into the country? And if we, you know, one of the other things we want to do is eventually manufacture them in the country. And they've given us time. They've introduced us to the right people, things like that. But it took time. And there was a lot of barriers um, at first. Uh, and I think even within the, the wider organization, there's always barriers to things which are new and different. But I think the freedom was given by the team that we we're operating in. Was there either a moment or a person or a kind of a point you could go back to and say, this is when we started to get traction? <clears throat> I, think, I think we started to get traction, actually. The big traction came as when the uh, uh, Unilever Ghana released their annual report. And inside the annual report, the letter to the shareholders, David Moretti, who was the MD there, had written about the, uh, the clean team uh, incentive. And you know, we, we were sitting in the office and they gave it to us. We're like, wow. You, know, you we had written about the what? I'm sorry? About the, in the letters to the director, the letters to the shareholder in, in Ghana, the, the managing director had written a letter there saying that we have this initiative and we're going to help the problems uh, of sanitation in, in Ghana. And we're like, wow, that's official. And you went, oh my God, we're actually going to do it, you mean? Yeah. Right. And I think also one of the other moments is when we started getting, uh, obviously we're using a, a joint funding, so we use funders' uh, money through our NGO partners, is when we started receiving funding and getting more and more recognition. So you know, it, it kind of made us think, well, we're not completely crazy. And I think really the thing that really get, gave it to me was when, you know, I think someone went to go visit, um, someone from a university went to go visit our project and goes, I can't believe everything is exactly the same a year later. Because a lot of these projects and a lot of these ideas, it's like, wow, this is a great idea. And then it starts off great. And then like a year later, it falls to pieces. And the person came back a year later and it's like, wow, this is exactly how I saw it a year ago. And the vision is actually coming to life. Um, and that's, I think, one of the biggest challenges you have in Africa and in a lot of these, especially in sanitation, a lot of the things are great ideas and they fall apart. Whereas I think that also was a, a very good moment. Megan, let me ask you about that. Was there, you know, what's the... What has it allowed, has allowed you, and I know that has not necessarily been a, a straight line um, in your work, but what has allowed you the degrees of freedom to get as far as you have? What's in any, to get as far any... as I have in this project? I think th there is a difference between uh, the way the project, your, your project was set up within Unilever as a corporation, and, and in my case, um, with the decision to take this project uh, from concept to realization, um, not only that I physically moved uh, to the Philippines, but also I, I basically moved my, my employer. So our project is embedded in the Hilti Foundation, and it's not the Hilti Corporation, uh, opposite of, of what is your project is about. Um, the Hilti Corporation does fund the project through the foundation, obviously. And I think that is... is very critical, I think, because it allows us to, to really have this freedom, as I mentioned before, to go to a country for 12 to 18 months and explore and not have to think about reporting guidelines and procedures within a large corporation. So it's almost like a nucleus, uh, you know, of like a, a different universe where you have all the freedom you need to explore all the opportunities. While I think maybe, and I don't know if that's the case with you, but if, if, if you try to set up a business within an existing corporation, you usually have to undergo the usual processes and reporting you know, rules and all of that. Um, and, and the fact that we are within the foundation, I think, has given us this freedom. And then, obviously, 
also the, the division, the vision of some of our leaders who, um, who said, you know, this, this is a great opportunity. While we are in construction, it's not necessary. We don't necessarily do that to maybe generate additional business in the future, but to, to be involved in really tackling a huge problem we have and, and, and pl become a player in this field. And I think that's very critical. I mean, you cannot alone as an individual push these projects. You need to have leaders, visionary leaders, who really support you in this effort. Um, because otherwise, I don't no, know. I, totally agree, I don't I think, know how we I do think, it. You know, if, if this, if I wasn't in this team that I joined, and you know, I don't think it would have particularly have happened out of the core categories of what Unilever does. So, you know, you, I couldn't imagine a project like this coming out of certain parts of the business because it's not really our business. It's like a total different business model. And I think we had a great leader who who thought out the box and the team. Everybody who was working in the team were very open-minded, very willing to do things differently. They weren't going to go down the traditional path of doing things. And, and the whole open innovation method also. So we're very open and we shared, we say worked with open idea, we worked with a whole lot of different people. It was very different to how, um, how the organization would usually operate. Same for us. What, what would you add to this? You're still on the journey. We're all still on the journey, yes. but... Never ending. I guess mine would be a little different. It's, it's probably the small value add I have. Um, it, and what I mean by that is, you know, in my case, a lot of people look at me and say, what do you know about alternative energy in Turkey? And um, do you know how to pick stocks or you know how to look at businesses? Um, and my value add actually came in, within, in the form of market knowledge, the fact that I was doing work with the country for over a year um, when I took on this project and the people that I work with, the structuring experts, the government affairs individuals, and our sustainability team who are based in the United States actually found value in, in the linkage I could provide with on the ground uh, market perspective and sort of the intellectual thinking that was happening in, um, in a developed market, obviously, in the United States. So, so that, playing that, kind of a connected role is there yes. as well. What, um, let me ask you one more question, then I want to open it up to the, to the room for a conversation. I know a lot of expertise uh, exists in this room. Uh, David Grayson is here from Crownfield. David, where are you? David has just produced a, a report on social entrepreneurs. There is an initiative underway to try to create a league of social entrepreneurs. So there are many people who are bringing new knowledge and thinking into this field. But let me just ask you, um, whoever feels like responding to this question, um, I know because I've had the pleasure of sitting um, in the room, I don't run the fellowship program. My colleague Nancy McGaw does. If, for those of you that want to find out more, there's a website. But I know from hearing a lot of stories over these these uh, last five years um, that the, it's not always easy here. It's not a straight path, and there are very there are moments when uh, that are that are very difficult. So I'm kind of interested, professionally and personally, what helps you stay at this? Are there times when you have thought? Maybe I'm going down the wrong road, and, and I'm not sure this is worthwhile. And what's kind of helped you kind of stay? Any of you? Asahan, go. go ahead. I think it's just, you, it's a calling. It's something you just have to do. It's not like, you know, I mean, I had my corporate job. And then, and in addition to that, I, I have this passion to bring it both together. You know, having impact, social impact, environmental impact, and doing business. And, and find this ideal combination. And usually that is not like easy. So you have a job and then on top of that you have another job. Um, but I never considered it as a job. It was something drove me always that I wanted to do this. So it's, it's uh, it, this, this inner calling or whatever you call it, you know, this feeling this is the right thing gets you through, through difficult times so when you feel like what I'm doing here. And then I think the network, and, and I mean, the network, your family, your, your environment, um, but also, for example, the Aspen Network. I mean, the Aspen Fellowship, the, my fellows were particularly in very critical times, very important because I could call them up and we could talk about things in a, in, in a, in a you know, and they understood. They resonated with me because they've gone through similar things. So I think what you need is just to, to have perseverance to stay on track and, and, and have people around you who, who help you and to understand and support you. Um, and, and I think in the opening session, uh, I think it was uh, 
uh, Grow Brundtland who said this as well, you have to surround yourself with people who believe in you and who are there and carry you when you need to be carried. One of the aspects of the Aspen Fellowship is a mentorship program, and sometimes that works and sometimes it doesn't, but often people collect more mentors in the course of the fellowship, so that's also a, a piece of the puzzle. James? Yeah, so I think, I think for me, um, the thing that keeps me going is that when I go out to these places and I actually see the huge impact we're making on these families and these people, um, I think that's like the deeper reason. But the other reason, I, what keeps me going is I'm really passionate about business and about doing things differently. And I think that the way that business has been done now can be changed. And I think there's a huge opportunity to do massive social good, but at the same time doing good business. So I, I, the whole time working on Clean Team and creating Clean Team, I was never seeing it as creating something that was just going to help people. I always saw it as helping people, but also creating a business. So the whole way we run the company and everything is very much like a multinational company, how it's run. But at the same time, what we're delivering to the people is so rewarding. So everybody who works on the team and, and who we recruit and who works with us are all very, very passionate about sanitation, about solving these problems. So a lot of the staff who work with us have had uh, problems in the past, how they grew up, and they want to make a difference. But at the same time, all, we, the number one thing is their business sense, right? So we're not trying to recruit people um, who are trying to solve sanitation by making a lot of noise. We want people who are, who are business-minded, but at the same time have a good heart in, in, in the right place. And I think that's the way I operate. And you know, when, when I, when I leave, every time I leave, I feel that you know, I just want to make sure that the project succeeds you know, for those reasons. And I think um, it's really, really rewarding. And uh, you know, that I'm not going to let it fail because it's really personal to me. And if you want to see a great YouTube piece, there's a three-minute YouTube video if you Google Clean Team, and I think I don't think Unilever doesn't show up much in there, but it's a fabulous three-minute kind of brings his project alive. Just regular and, and I totally agree because at the end of the day, these, these are huge problems, and we, we talked about that the last three days. And business has the power to scale, and so business has the role to play. And exactly, it, it, it they, they just have to properly interlink. And I think we're all very clear business people, and and and. So bringing business together with those aspects can really bring solutions to, to, to and scalable solutions. And in my case, I would add that um, it's it was I went to Nigeria and you know I was working on a project and I realized I sort of had a moment when I felt like I was so far removed from the reality that I had to get closer to having impact. So. Personally, that's what drives me. And then once I cross that um, bridge, what I came to realize is that there's an incredible, incredible amount of intellectual capital that's going into solving these issues. And, and, it, and it sort of excites me more every day to, to be a part of these group of individuals that are trying to um, make changes. And, um, the center here at Skoll. Uh, has been encouraging of bringing this conversation, this kind of a disruptive conversation into this conference, which is largely about social enterprises that are really not always organized around business thinking. So it's great to have this conversation in the context of this room. So let's just open it up. Hi, I'm Dorji Mundel from Novartis, uh, working in corporate responsibility. Um, I agree, firstly, that you need leaders to give you the degrees of freedom to operate in. And I think kind of giving you a sandpit to play in that's protected from some of the structures of the organization, the controls and so on, like you, you're doing in Hilti Foundation, so that Hilti can help get things off the ground. Both of what you're, what you're both doing um, in Hilti and Unilever is starting something new and kind of a bit different. When you get to the next stage of then having to take that into the mainstream of the business, and it's not about doing something exotic, but it's actually trying to change the way you operate structurally as a company. Um, then you start encountering a whole bunch of really interesting challenges. Um, and the best place I've seen those articulated is by Clayton Christensen when he describes the internal uh, barriers to disruptive innovation. He wasn't thinking about social entrepreneurship or entrepreneurship, but it's the perfect articulation. And I just wanted to ask if any of you have come head you know uh, come up against those kind of barriers where actually this is changing 
your organization's expectations from being a high margin business to base a pyramid and that means that means margin dilution for your for your country's organize your country organizations financial results or these kind of structural issues these kind of barriers where it start, it stops being a fun nice thing on the side but it actually changes the way you operate as an organization i think uh, I think you're very correct in that sense, and I think uh, one of the big challenges we're going to face with the toilet business is that it's not what Unilever does. So when, you know, <laughs> we, we're an FMCG company, so we're very good at, uh, you know, uh, innovating on products, getting them on the shelves and selling them and uh, marketing them really well. So sometimes when you present, I present this project to some of the, the you know, the, the, the heads of the categories and stuff, they do struggle to fully understand it because they've spent their entire career doing exactly this. Um, and I think... One thing that we have done is like the structure that we've created around the company has always been that Unilever would be a partner and not necessarily bring it back into the core organization because we don't sell toilets. But we are, we are a consumer goods company, so that's why when I created the business, I had this section where the guy that goes around collecting the money uh, for the service also sells and offers uh, Unilever products. So it gives us a, um, another retail channel, which then Unilever very easily can operate uh, from a distance with that organization. But I think when you're trying to bring something very different into the organization, I think it's, you know, I come across a lot of different barriers all the time when, when you present it to different people. I mean, it's the same for Hilti. I don't see how they integrate it into the business. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's not just a different product. It's a different business model. Hilti produces tools and consumables. This is housing. So it's, it's, it's different. But it's related because it's in the construction. So I really don't see how they, maybe in the future, but I, at this point, I don't see how they would do that. And also, I agree. I mean, the, the setup is, is critical in the future. I mean... You ask me what the setup will be, I don't know, but it could be a corporation, an independent company where Hilti and Hilti Foundation are you know, an equity investor, for example, to, to boost new technologies and new ideas in the business. I mean, I really don't see that, that, that you know, critical. I think whether it's part of a company or not, as long as corporations use their skills, their human skills, and, and the, the financing they have, their other skills to really contribute to, to, uh, to larger problems we have and find business models which are scalable and sustainable. Um, but what I think is one critical component, we, we hardly talk, we always talk about you know, the financial impact it has or it could have when integrating it back into a corporation. For me, the most critical component is the impact it has on the people the culture of a company, the way we recruit people. I mean, it is, it's about who we are. It's about the values we represent as a company and the, and the responsibilities we have. And for me, that is, maybe you cannot track it in financial terms that easily, but I truly see that, that this kind of initiatives, Unilever does or we do or, or City does, has such an impact on the people and the culture, and then it has an impact on the way we do business and eventually on the bottom line. That, that's something that I talk quite a lot about our project, and I say that you know, if it fails miserably, we still created so many new ways of working, so many new innovative ideas, different th things that it's already uh, affecting the wider business. So a lot of people come to us and ask us questions about like, how did you do this? Why did you do that? And eventually that, that's <coughs> going to change the way that the business does things. So eventually, you know, I, I don't know what's coming down the pipeline, but in the future, a lot of the people who are going to be joining the organization will start thinking a lot more like myself. And over time, the, the big companies will start changing and looking at different things, not just the margins that they need to make but how they affect the communities they work in. Um, but uh, you know, I, I still think there's a huge opportunity where you can make decent margins, decent business, but do social good. Um, and I think the thing is it's, a, it's innovation that can do that. It, you, people shouldn't be scared of it. They should look at how, it's, you know, how can we solve those challenges. It's interesting. In both cases, there are, you've kind of uh, ring-fenced the project, and I think that's an area for more study. Um, it certainly, we talked about this last night at dinner, it certainly made me start thinking about what are the various structures by which a corporation does that naturally to drive innovation now and where does this, where would this be centered? Actually, I would say in our case, innovation has to happen within the businesses. So um, in my project, it's a bit more integrated versus being ring fenced. So um, the only obstacle I would say is, is employee behavior in that if you need to deliver certain returns or close X, Y, Z projects or number of projects, revenue targets, et cetera, within a year, 
then obviously you're going to allocate more time to that versus a three-year project. Right. Um, so it's a bit of a balance for the employees and their time commitment. Um, that's how I see it played. I mean, in your case, or in general, you would have to change the performance management system. You have to change, to, if you want to have the focus shifted from short-term thinking to more long-term projects, you know, then you need to, to adjust the compensation system accordingly that people start changing their behaviors. But here we go into a, you know, a huge topic in general. Well, it's a huge topic, and it's one that many organizations, including ours, have been working on for a considerable period of time. So it's a, it is a twin piece of this puzzle. You can drive change from within, but you also have to influence the decision rules and incentive systems on the outside. Okay, good bullock from Accenture Development Partnerships. It's a great conversation. I mean, I'd use the analogy that you know, we're on the Titanic, and um, you know, do you, we see the iceberg. Do you launch... Uh, a lifeboat, or do you try and change change course? And I think we've got a, a variety of different um, things here. And I think if you do want to change course, then you're absolutely right. You, it's it's systemic. It's going to be about changing um, performance systems, etc. My my question is really around leadership. And David Grayson's report talks a lot about the role of leadership. Yes, CEOs, but also godparents and sponsors that you have internally. But as we know, CEOs, um, we we all love Paul Pullman. I don't know what the life expectancy is these days. Um, they come and go. Uh, uh, you might be fantastic and riding very high, a couple of quarters, poor financial results, and uh, you can be toast. So how do you really... Um, this is not a projection for Unilever. No, 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 no. I, 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 I hope Paul Pullman would go on forever, may I say, for the record. But, um, but you know, you can't physically. It's impossible. So how do you, you know, make sure that the baton can be passed and that you do not sort of wither on the vine if, if a supportive leader moves on? So I think uh, one thing that... Uh, uh, pass that back to David. Uh, the, the interactions I've had with Paul Palmer is quite interesting. Um, I was at a conference uh, for young leaders, and Paul wanted to meet all of us. He'd spoken at it. And afterwards, he, he said to us something that he's very, very passionate about is a bottom-up movement on sustainability and all these things. So he says he stands at the top talking a lot about... Um, the organization and his views and everything. But he said, what's going to really make a difference is the new people coming into the business, the young people creating up this, creating this bottom-up movement. And I think that's, that's really where the big change is going to start happening. And I know from, for a fact that I interview all the um, some interns for Unilever, and it's amazing how many people are moved by what he's saying and why they want to come and join the company. And they're very talented people from top universities. And I think that, that is really where things are going to start changing because you know, quite often you can be standing at the top talking a lot, making a lot of noise, but it takes a while to filter through the organization and people to get in line with that vision. And I think something I learned from the Aspen um, course was the, 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 the Trevor they call it the Trevor, and it's you know, there's somebody that can make these things happen for you, a senior leader who gets what you're trying to do and supports you through all these things because it's, it's very, you know, a real roller coaster that you go through. Um, but I definitely think that you know, even when eventually Paul Pullman leaves, I think the movement he would have created and the new people brought into the organization should hopefully keep that um, momentum and vision going. We also have a concept called the anti-Trevor, which is neutralizing the person who could be is best positioned to kill your project yeah. if you don't figure out how to neutralize them. Hi, Judy. Hi. Maggie Dupree from Imaginals. Um, I have a question for the panelists, but first a sort of question or sort of provocation for the audience. So as Judy mentioned, one of our projects called the League of Entrepreneurs. So we've been working with Accenture um, and a number of other folks, Aspen's in as an advisor. Um, Ashoka has been a key sponsor of this work to sort of learn from the community of social entrepreneurs. Um, social entrepreneurs are amazing and doing wonderful work. We need companies to big large corporations to be moving as well we need both it's not either or it's both and and so we've been exploring what can we learn from the social entrepreneurship community to support these amazing entrepreneurs these change makers inside so we just had our first inaugural awards on tuesday not quite as red carpet as school but um we had 15 finalists and a few of them are here um for social entrepreneurs and my sort of question provocation to all of you um if you'd see me after is how how can we do this? How can we really support this movement and community? Um, the question I have for the panelists is around financing. I um, would love to hear more about how you've gotten your project financed, but as you look ahead to scaling up the work, what do you see as the, some of the barriers and opportunities around financing your projects? How, first of all, for all three of you, is that a key constraint? Yes. Yes, sure. Okay, so dive in. 
So with our model, um, it's quite interesting. So we obviously we created a public-private partnership. So what we wanted to always do, so we wanted to use donor money and Unilever um, interaction. So how it went is... And you need donor money because... We need donor money because the infrastructure of the project. So what we always said is that we'd use the donor money as almost like an investment fund going into the company. So, so far we've had, um, you know, we've worked with um, different foundations, uh, the Gates Foundation, Stone Foundation, and that money that's been used actually only pays for infrastructural things. It's never paid for any of the salaries of the workers, for any of the, the chemicals or anything that are used in the toilets. But the design of the toilet? The design of the toilet was through Unilever. So we used, you know, what we tried to do is have uh, Unilever's input plus donor input, so you'd have a combined input. Plus we obviously have our NGO partner, and what we try to do is that we create an entire, our entire business is created around that model of having uh, pi uh, private public um, funding. And we always want to use the, the, the donor funds and that money as bringing in money to, you know, all the money goes towards buying toilets, infrastructure things. So it's a big investment, but then all the things like the salaries and all of that is paid for. And over time, the whole idea is that eventually when the company starts turning profitable, then you'll be able to start paying back those loans and things like that. And it's, it's even set up as a you know, proper company with shares and we have a financial thing, we do all of this stuff. So it's, it's a full business, but we've used the donor funds to um, get it going. You're all about capital. Aslihan, where's the capital um, coming from? I'm going to answer it from a different angle, not Please. necessarily funding my project because the project doesn't necessarily need to be funded, but we're trying to solve the financing question itself. And our biggest challenge is taking, you know, getting our institutional partners or the non-traditional sources of capital, even hedge fund or sovereign wealth fund capital, and funnel it into these um, problems in emerging markets. But the biggest problem with emerging markets is that it equals uncertainty, rule of law, political environment. They all become issues. So for us, it's in order to do a project at scale, how do you get the right partners to be able to get that financing into the into solving the solutions, and that's a hard question. But it's you know you need government partnership in the first place to sort of get past some of those hurdles and constraints. So just being in the private sector is not a panacea here. You still are out there raising capital and support from outside the business institution because of the constraints on your own capital sources. Is what I'm hearing. Because at the moment, you know, the, for 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 Unilever, the, you know, they're not going to invest large quantities of money in it because it's not going to be returning back to them. So that's why we were always saying that we need to have this joint partnership because you're trying to solve a social problem but at the same time trying to create a business. Do you have any idea how much Unilever has put in so far? Um, not off the top of my head. And, and I know that it's you know, obviously a lot in terms of time and resource, so my time. Right, uh, no, I meant the all in. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then obviously, then obviously, yeah. 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 and obviously, in terms of the um, technology and the branding and all these kind of things, we've added a lot of that in. You have a thought on capital before we move on? Yeah, I mean, the Hilti Foundation does fund the first phase. Uh, we have clearly defined milestones which we have to reach. Uh, we have to go back and report to them in September and uh, to, to basically see whether they're willing to fund the next phase. Uh, but I think if we're realistic and look at a reasonable business model and a model which is scalable, we need funding. And that means I need to go out and find either donor money or patient capital, social capital. David Grayson from the Doughty Center for Corporate Responsibility in the Cranfield School of Management. I've never met Trevor, but all of our research also confirms the importance of, of having somebody who's not right at the, the most stratospheric level of a CEO, but who will give an emergent social entrepreneur the kind of the air cover as a kind of patient godparent mm -hmm. who will be able to introduce them to people inside the organization and very often also make introductions outside and also help them to find some spare resources inside the company, whether it's a particular foundation a company foundation or a new business models unit or, or whatever. But, but I'd like to ask all of the panel, we've just um, launched this week a, a, a new report about what's the enabling environment that will make it easier for more social entrepreneurs to emerge inside large companies. Thank you very much. Yep, never miss a marketing opportunity as next Potter and Gamble, soap powder salesman. Um, I'm interested, what's the panel's experience from being part particularly of, of the wonderful First Movers program as well, and, and talking to your colleagues, if you could do one thing inside your company to make it easier for more social entrepreneurs to emerge, what would it be? What would change 
inside your organizations that might make it easier for more social entrepreneurs to emerge? I would allow them to, for those who actually have the desire and willingness to take on something, carve out a certain amount of their time. The Google um, model? What's that? The Google model, 20%. Oh, right, exactly, and, and leave them alone see what they can do and you know I don't think you always need that big CEO support if people have it within themselves they'll go and find their collaborations and um, they'll make it happen so I think get the right talent and leave them alone and you know for 20 percent of their time and set longer term targets versus their six month or 12 month um, targets Add? Yeah, I, I think you know. I think it's you know giving the people the opportunity and the time. And I think the, the, if you really want to make these things happen, is giving more and more people that chance. So I think the company, you know, I I, I think really working on these kind of projects de develops people's leaderships, develops people's abilities. So I think it needs to be run pretty much out of it, like a, out of the HR function or somewhere where people go in there, they have the opportunity, you know, it's, you don't even need that much money. It gives people the freedom to be very entrepreneurial. Um, but in a, in a space where they have no constraints, but are also watched over in a sense. So, is there, is there anything in your performance appraisal systems, your KPIs, or all of that jargon you guys use inside corporations? Is there anything that actually this helps you? Um, I think that you need to get away from all of that stuff. <laughs> uh, that's the only way you're going to make people do these amazing things. And, and, and that's so like the short literally. Short answer that would be no. In no. fact, it's a it's a barrier, not a. It's a, a barrier not because a as soon as you I mean, then. You know, City Group talks all the time about their balance scorecard. Is this part of the balance of the scorecard? Mine? No. <laughs> yeah, because a lot of people are doing these things. It's not on. You know, I, I, a few colleagues of mine worked on something similar in the organization. It was like it was crazy. Like one of the guys is like, "Well, oh, don't tell my boss I'm meeting you guys. Like this is a I'm like meeting a customer at the moment." It was things like it got really insane because. It's, you know, it's not really where your time should be put, and, but people are passionate. And I think what you need to do is find these people, give them the opportunity to allow these passions to grow because it's going to help organization. And I've, I've seen it. A lot of people end up leaving our company because they want to go out and do these things. They can't find those opportunities. And these people tend to be really, really talented. Um, and that's why I think somewhere in the organization they need to create um, like a lab or somewhere where you've given these people opportunities. And I think there's a lot of people that will, be, will sign up to do it. Um, and I just think it needs a bit of courage and someone to take that step. So I don't know how where it's going in the organization. Obviously, Unilever is a big place. It could be talking about we were it. We talking last night about the number of uh, organizations that have created these opportunities, kind of um, fellowships within a corporation to be able to go and exit and go and work in Africa for six months and then come back in. And, and, and oftentimes, it's very hard for those people to come back in. And so the question is, how do you create that space but allow it to be a place from which you can continue to work as opposed to one that creates this disconnect. Quick response here, and we'll try to get two more questions out there. We've only got four minutes left, so. Okay, a quick I think it's not easy to, to, to answer, actually. Um, what we have done uh, in the last few years is everything came through, obviously, the Hilti Foundation, but we, we allowed or we, we set up a virtual system where uh, people in the market, local market organizations who have an interest can step up and take a leadership role in pushing initiatives in their own country um, within our market organizations. And, but I, I agree as well. I mean, it, it, you could include it somehow into the strategy. Uh, it has to do with values. Um, but I think HR has to play a key role in allowing these things to happen, in allowing room for people to grow and not just get their job done, but really allow them to do other things beyond. Back to the, back to the talent question. I saw two hands up. Daniela Feuchtmeier from the BMW Group. <coughs> Hi. Um, on the strategic outset of the projects that you reported about, was there um, thinking shared value, a real business impact target as well, coming back to the parent company, you know, about closing that right. loop? This touches a bit on the, first com uh, on the first question we heard from Deutsche Bank, you know, to make it really sustainable to feed back well, into the core business. I from Unilever that the, the business proposition is really getting, uh, broadening the market and deepening the market to sell traditional Unilever products. Do you, either of the two of you? Not in our case. I mean, as I said, it, it, it's separated. It has an impact on, on, on the people within the corporation, but it's not that, that it 
this, this business idea, if it flies, will be integrated into the Hilti Corporation. But yes, I have KPIs and I have to make it a sustainable business out of it. But it's, it's really not, it's separated and it's not going to fu go full circle with the Hilti Corporation. Okay. In, in, speed, my speed, oh. in my case, it is yeah. integrated, that's all. It, it will come back uh, as a revenue opportunity. Exactly. In your case, it is a fund inside Citigroup. It's designed to work as a conventional yeah. business yeah. model. So, so it is, is it is a fund, and then this is financial yeah. impact. What about? No, it's oh, sorry. It's within the business. It's happening within the product line. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm sitting in a unique position where I, I I'm sort of an outsider coming into the project, but it's definitely coming within business. Okay, and this is spreading to other product lines as well. Um, yes, there are some functions that support it. Thank you. It's early on, but it has the potential to do that if she succeeds. Here? Yes, I'm Eric Ishikawa from the International Finance Corporation. The mission statement of what we do is to give private sector funding in emerging markets. We are part of the World Bank Group. But I think it's very interesting because even within an organization where the goals are very clear, uh, I had to set up something uh, a few years ago to focus on giving awards to people who are doing business models that really reach the poor. And it is part of, you know, more and more part of HR, but it wasn't. Uh, it wasn't even part of our dictionary. Right. So in a large corporation, if you're an entrepreneur, you have to actually start out by defining what it is you're trying to do, making sure that it's part of the system, and then making sure that the incentive system gets aligned eventually. It doesn't happen right away. So if you want it to be sustainable, then you really have to work from within and disrupt in a very quiet way at the beginning. So, you know, we used to call it the ninja strategy until we actually had a lot of the things done. So I just had a real quick question, which is for some of the models, it looks like you're thinking of a spin-off if it is successful. Uh, I think affordable housing, sanitation, these are really very important uh, models. If you can crack the business model and have other people take over and, and do it, is that kind of just what was trying to figure out the yeah. vision? I think, I think that was always, um, always our vision. We, and, and the way we operate and treat it, we treat it as a startup. I mean, that's what we try to make, you know, that's what we say. We're trying to bring in a new way of doing sanitation, and that's, that, that's exactly what we've done. But using you know, the, the support of the big multinational. And the, the, within our actual group, it was all the venture group teams are based within that group also. So that's why our thinking was. And this one is also designed to be, potentially you were saying, you answered that question earlier. Yes, I mean, it's, again, it's too early in our case to say what kind of a business model. It, maybe it's just open source, a new way of constructing with alternative building material. For me, ultimately, is what is needed to have scale? And I don't want to be stuck with the idea of an LLC, you know, a limited liability company or something. Whatever it takes to make this, get this to the market at the right price, to the right customer, will be done, or has to be done. And I don't want to define now how it is and what it's, what it's going to be. So I know there are many other comments and questions and thoughts. And uh, this was a very short session. It gave a little window in. I hope the conversation will continue. Let me just have you each finish with 10 words, no more, advice to social entrepreneurs from where you sit. Let's start with you, Aslan. I'm going to flip it around. I took on something that had nothing to do with my job, and I found new um, interests and horizons. So I would encourage you to pick something that you have nothing to do with and explore it <coughs> and see how far you can go. There you go. Any advice? No, I think, again, yes, yeah, something, do something you feel passionate about and, and you know that it's not, it's not work, it's not a job, it's what you want to do that drives you and then stay on track. Uh, my, my advice would be innovate around the challenges. <coughs> Find the right challenge and innovate on the edge. Yeah, innovate around it because look at it as an opportunity and you'll have a lot of fun. All right, thanks everybody. Thanks for <laughs>